Well, well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Hello, folks. Today we are joined by Ms. Anissa Lumpkin to discuss AFRL's Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Programs, the Historically Black College and Universities Initiative, and Jamie Foxx's classic film, Stealth. In three, two, one. Anissa, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Michelle. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. Yeah. Thanks. Super excited because we don't always get to talk about movies on our podcast, but we're going to start today talking about probably one of the greatest films ever, which is Stealth, right? <laughs> That's a joke, right? So uh... <laughs> I've never actually watched it, but I, I've read a few Rotten Tomatoes reviews. Yeah, so uh, Stealth was was fun in, in terms of I actually have a, a connection to to the movie. And um, so really, really early on in my career, there was a movie with Jamie Foxx and Jessica Biel and Josh Lucas, you know, really hot actors at the time. And um, so they did a movie based on the Joint Unmanned Combat Air System uh, program that I worked on. Um, It was a joint program with the Army, Navy and Air Force. And even Jamie Foxx even came out to see the, the aircraft. Uh, but really, Stealth is is a movie about a, U, a UCAV that actually goes amok. I mean, it goes crazy. It starts taking over and, and you know, takes over the whole world. And just, it, it was, the concept was good. Just, you know, maybe the execution wasn't all that great. But everyone in our team, it was really exciting because everyone in our team went to see the movie. And so they got a few things right. So one of the things that I worked on was the neural network that they had on the, that they kind of featured in the film. And um, it actually was something that we uh, really worked on um, in terms of our standard aperture radar and how all of that came together, that common operating system. And so it was really, it was really cool to see some of the work that we did come to life. It's just that I don't think that, that our uh, Air Force UCAVs are going to go and, and Navy UCAVs are going to go and take over the world. We don't have to worry about that. <laughs> that's a good thing. I, don't, <laughs> it, I mean, it, it's, that's just fun. I mean, we, yeah. we have a lot of people in the lab that write science fiction on the side because a, a lot of science fiction or, you know, these uh, imagine imaginative storylines. I mean, they come from smart people that are working on futuristic far stuff. So I mean, it's kind of cool that like, oh, they saw what you're doing. They're like, oh, yeah, the general public will think this is like crazy. I mean, not the things going rogue, <laughs> but just the right. technology itself. It, that's kind of cool, you know? Yeah, I always like to see how Hollywood, Hollywood's take on, you know, especially military and technology and, and their, their take on it, right? They can always make it look a lot cooler than <laughs> sometimes in what we're doing. Was, and, I was just thinking, you said making it look cooler. We we did communication shop, had an animation of a, a technology initiative for 2030, and we had some CGI on there, and we released it, and then Twitter was telling us we were ripping off stealth <laughs> from, from some of the animated planes over, you know, desert areas. It, it was, it was a lot of fun. So, but I understand what it's like to be ripped now. <laughs> like uh, just the way that uh, I think that stealth was ripped according to the the reviews that I've now read about it. <laughs> Did I hear right that Jamie Foxx visited? Did you get a chance to meet him? You know, I've, I've always heard that he really takes his role seriously. So it was really neat to, to see him come and, and see the aircraft and kind of talk to to everybody that's working on new advanced concept at the time and so it was demonstrated the first unmanned stealth bomber so that was pretty cool you know having him come out and and, and see us at uh, edwards air force base was really was really a, a neat concept um the funny thing is you know when we talk about hollywood version versus real technology is when you talk about an online air vehicle it doesn't have a, a cockpit but, you know, in the Hollywood version, they have a cockpit because I don't want to do any spoilers, but, you know, there was a reason for needing to hop for that uh, air vehicle to have a cockpit so that they could save the world. But <laughs> <laughs> nice. well, you heard it here first, listeners. You have homework to do. Watch Stealth and get back to us in the comments. We want to know what you think. <laughs> Because this is, uh, again, a film I've never seen. But now that we have a hook here, I mean, <laughs> I mean could be the are- next big thing again, a resurgence. You know, we are in quarantine, so if you don't have anything else left to watch, check out Stealth. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, and 12% on Rotten Tomatoes, and it's from 2005, <laughs> action thriller. I think Ken was probably in kindergarten, something like that. Maybe, maybe second okay, whoa, whoa. grade. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> a yeah, little closer. <laughs> a little closer. Okay. Well, flash forward or backwards, however you want to do. Like, Anissa, how did you get started within the Air Force? You have a, a really interesting career. I feel like I was completely tricked into the Air Force. And it wasn't by the Air Force. It was by my father. And I was a student. Um, I went to Tennessee State University. And I was going and getting ready to go into my sophomore year. And my dad is like, you need to take this leadership course. I really think you need some more leadership skills in your life. And so I'm like, okay. So I trust my dad. He's a uh, my dad is an academic dean. He worked for University of uh, Wisconsin Madison. So I'm like, okay, I'll you know I'll take this leadership class. Well, it turned out to be Air Force ROTC, <laughs> and it was it was a leadership class that they had. And I actually, I fell in love with Air Force ROTC at that time. I mean, I liked I liked all of it, like the camaraderie, the the training, the the leadership skills that were developed, I felt like it was some of the best times in my college career in, in my life. I mean, the money, the scholarship and everything, that 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 was definitely awesome and helped too. Because I don't come from a military family. We don't have, you know, a lot of military people in my in my family, maybe a couple. Um, and so I was really kind of like the the trailblazer, you know, really stepping into the the Air Force and the military life. And I really just kind of winged it. And but I really enjoyed just just all of that. So I guess it was a good trick to have. And then I come to find out my dad actually, he always wanted to join the military, but his eyesight was horrible. And, and so uh, you know, he kind of passed it on, passed it on to me. But you know, I, it was definitely a blessing and I appreciated it. Hey, well, that's great, though. At least he was able to say, hey, if I couldn't do it myself, at least he knew you could not only succeed, but thrive in that environment. And uh, that, that's a question I had for you then is how was it balancing like being with ROTC and doing your standard classwork while you're in school? I really recommend the Air Force ROTC program in, in your undergraduate studies because it, it, it allows you to have that balance. You know, you, you do your, you know, you go work out in the morning uh, sometimes with your with your flight. And you have military studies classes once a week. And so, but the rest of the week, you know, you're, you're just a regular student. You know, once a week, you put on your uniform and uh, you, do, you do your military studies. But the rest of the time, you're just a regular, you know, a regular student. It's just, a, you know, somebody that plays sports or, you know, somebody that is on the debate team. You know, you, it's just, it's, a, it's another activity that is just another part of your college experience and with air force rotc you know it's a bit it's a little bit more serious in terms of you know the commitment that you make uh it actually helps you know it helps with peace of mind with having funding for your education as well as they give you uh, a stipend so that you can really concentrate on your studies more so i think when you join you get uh mentors right so my my commander of our detachment, Colonel Samuel Brown Jr. was the one that first brought me in and really guided me on, hey, you know, this is how you do this and do that. And, you know, they let you learn and make mistakes along the way, understanding I'm still a college student. I don't know anything about this, this military life. I don't even, I don't, you know, at the time, I didn't even know what the different aircraft were that the Air Force was working on. So just brand new to it. But just really good mentors and flight commanders and you know, the camaraderie with the other students. Uh, my detachment was unique in that um, it actually is at an HBCU, but uh, the other universities in the surrounding areas would students would come to our detachment. So we had students like from Vanderbilt University, Tennessee Tech, Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, that all came together. Um, as we're all training to become officers in the United States Air Force. So that was a unique experience at, at that particular detachment. So it was good. Yeah, that's brilliant. Like to think about how many uh, amazing minds and people that you mentioned coming from across the spectrum and the fact that you, a lot of people when they get to a university may have trouble finding their niche, finding a group to hang out with, or even finding mentors. And you got all of it. <laughs> so that, that's a great experience to really give you that university feel. 
Yeah, I mean, it was great. I mean, when I first got to college, I, I thought I wanted to be a dentist. And I uh, my freshman year, and I was like, oh, my God, I don't like biology. I don't really like any of this stuff. I hate it. And I felt and I actually felt kind of lost in terms of, you know, I, not, you know, for majority of my life, I thought this is what I wanted to do. And then come to find out this is not what I wanted to do. And so being in ROTC, I was introduced to a lot of students that were in the aeronautical and industrial engineering technology program at TSU. And, uh, and so I learned a lot about that. And they actually accepted me into their um, into that college. And from there, that's when the, my, my grades went up. I really thrived and I just really had a lot of interest in it. And it was like, oh, wow, engineering is kind of more what I was in. Because, you know, well, I know when I was coming up for girls, if you were interested in STEM, a lot of times you were pushed into more of the science careers like doctor or dentist. I didn't know anything about um, engineering, really, or I wasn't really exposed to it. I had never met a woman, a black woman. I don't know if I've met a woman engineer at, you know, as I was growing up in college. And so um, just that also exposed me to a completely different career that I hadn't even thought about before. So that was another benefit as well. How did you end up at the laboratory from, you know, your ROTC, you're, you're, you're deciding to become an, an engineer. What was your path like? I got commissioned as a, as a, I was a lieutenant in the Air Force, and so I was assigned to the Human Effectiveness Directorate, and specifically the Warfighter Training Division at the time, which was kind of split between Wright-Patterson and Mesa Air Force Base. And um, so I did a work with um, night vision device training goggles and our distributed mission training, which was really an exciting experience on the research side of how we got our pilots ready for pilot training without having to put them, you know, here, just jump in this cockpit. So there was a a whole distributed mission training test bed set up to where they could interact in operational environment in a cockpit that looks just like the cockpit they're going to be in um, and, and really get that being able to make you know, mistakes and try out new things. When we were working our distributed mission training program, we we're connecting with our counterparts in, in the United Kingdom with our Air Force pilots. So that was all really neat. And the night vision device training goggles. So they're training goggles on um, just like the tra- the goggles that they would wear on a normal mission, but they could uh, use these as, as in the training environment. Um, So all of that was really new, bringing in pilots across the Air Force to come in and and test the various training on all of the um, training beds with F-16s. And so all of that was really neat. I actually crossed paths with General Pringle, our current Air Force commander at the time, because she was one of the division chiefs or branch chiefs at the time for the Warfighter Training Division. So that's kind of neat to see her now, you know, commanding the Air Force Research Laboratory, coming back to the lab is I know she's had a lot of experience in terms of, you know, our whole s and community and how that how that works. So you just shared a bit of your active duty role. When I met you, actually, you were a civilian. You're you're our legis- legislative liaison. That's a totally different role than, you know, studying what you would have expected, studying uh, engineering or working in the human effectiveness directorate. What does a legislative liaison do? And so a legislative liaison is is basically the person that is that connection to our members of Congress, our, or our state legislators in our area, and, and ensuring that we are at the forefront of the congressional interest items that, that may come about with the with Congress or, or anything that's going on um, in our legislation that's connected to the Air Force Research Laboratory. One of the things as a legislative liaison, I've had to do a lot of things that I had never expected to do. I've met a lot of, you know, con- congressionals, um, men and women. Um, I've written testimonies. I've actually been to, you know, one of my commanders was called to testify in a hearing. So I've, I've written testimonies. I've met, you know, met with the Speaker of the House to prepare the Air Force Research Laboratory for upcoming budgets or initiatives that we have going on. I look at the news completely 
differently now, right? And uh, versus this is what's going on in the news versus what's really going on day to day, what our congressmen and women are, are doing day to day to to ensure that our our nation is continuously going and, and working, right? So it was really fun. I mean, the whole gamut there from stealth to C-SPAN, like you're doing it all. <laughs> Yeah, I think I probably may have been in the background on C- on C-SPAN at one point. Like, well, I, I can see the other side of the people and the staff in the background, make, you know, making sure that their their bosses look good. I've taken selfies, you know, on the on the patio of the Speaker of the House's uh, patio deck and um, ridden on the on Capitol Hill, ridden in the tunnels and the, the secret tunnels and walkways that they have there. So. All of that was just really exciting, really exciting experience to to be able to experience our democracy and just seeing the how our our bureaucratic system, how it works and how and the things that make it challenging. And that's just amazing to think about how connected you were, how many, uh, like you said, important individuals, uh, you know, decision makers in our nation you got to bump elbows with. Um, and it's to, to really get you prepared for later in your career. Like what major takeaways did you have from that experience that really got you ready to come back for the uh, Small Business Innovation Research Program? For Air Force Civil and Sitter and the connection to legislative liaison, they really are, are connected because it comes down to service-led organization. And so with members of Congress, those are the folks that are signing our our, our checkbooks and, and our programs and making decisions at the top level for our programs. And so getting a chance to see on on the flip side, moving into small business, is that now I'm serving, you know, small businesses across the nation for this $800 million plus program that invests in small businesses to do research and development and innovative project ideas for to meet some of our Air Force needs. So that's one of the things that I love about SBIR. I worked in SBIR before a, a long time ago and um, our director, Bill Harrison, he, he convinced me to come back and take over the Air Force Research Laboratories. This, this is a really exciting program. Uh, we're the first ones to do a lot of very really innovative um, acquisitions. I'm one of the first people that moved off. I still work for the Air Force, but I my office is off base, uh, so that is really different and interesting. I, but I love it because I'm able to really connect with small businesses outside of the gate when they need it the most, and demonstrated things like credit card swipes in order to get small businesses on contract quickly. You know, contracting sprints. And then just continuing to to help and assist small businesses to and universities to participate in this program. We now have our open topics to where anybody with an innovative idea to meet Air Force needs can submit their proposal. And so we're looking at, you know, a lot of new companies coming to participate, like with startup companies. Now we're, we're targeting um, historically black colleges and universities to partner with small businesses to participate. So there's just a lot that is going on in the program. AFWorks is another organization that's participating in the, in the program. Um, so just a wealth of, of people that are involved in just meeting a lot of, of new people in the process. Now, now, big to small in the Silver Sitter program, for our listeners, could you explain what, really what it is? I mean, maybe we could throw out another, I mean, is it Shark Tank if we're just going to continue this like movie television a series of analogies to, to your career? I know people hear a lot about the pitch day. So the program is a three-phase program. So we'll start like the phase one. Phase one, you submit a proposal to one of our open topics. And our open topics have focus areas that are tied to Air Force needs. And so we will say in our solicitation, hey, these are some areas that the Air Force is looking on that we need help with from our industrial base. And so uh, small businesses submit proposals. If you go through the open topic process, you would receive a three-month contract for your phase one. And a three-month contract is typically about $50,000. And there's a few, maybe $150,000 award contracts. And that's three months. And we're looking for some of that research demonstration as well as customer discovery 
in the Air Force, aligning you to some of our programs of record and to, to ensure that you're, that we're kind of getting you um, in the direction of transitioning to one of our programs of record. And then from there, we will invite you to submit a proposal for phase two. And phase two is that technology demonstration phase. We're really transitioning you, transitioning your technology into one of our programs of record. It's typically about a $750,000 award. There's also a direct to phase two award. And that's if you've demonstrated that you already have a customer in the Air Force that's vying for your technology, you're past that first phase. Um, director phase two, there are a higher award limit. And then phase three is really our key success story. That's where a program is putting non civil funds onto your contract or with that small business. And they're saying that, hey, you know, this is where we're really showing <clears throat> transition and really connecting to the Air Force programs of record. Uh, one of the things that I would say is that <clears throat> with the Air Force Civil Center program um, and with STTR is when a small business partners with a university or research institution um, to make that partnership uh, succinct. And I'm glad you touched on that because something you'd mentioned beforehand was uh, the program you're running with historically black colleges and universities. So the HBCU uh, program you've been running, uh, how, when did that start? And can you kind of talk about its importance uh, with the CIBR and um, SETR programs? Yeah. So one of the things I mentioned was that I, I'm a graduate of a, of a historically black college and university, Tennessee State, go Tigers. And so last year, David Shahady, who's the director of of the Air Force Service Center Program. And he also had an experience with an HBCU. So we were talking about how when when he and I, when we looked at the at the data on the participation level for HBCUs, is we found that we weren't getting proposals from HBCUs into the program. And so we did a lot of research and really did our homework to, to find out hey, what, what are some barriers that are keeping HBCUs from participating in the Air Force STTR program? And so one of the things with the HBCU Outreach Initiative and Air Force STTR is to increase participation in Air Force research funding. You know, there's a lot of programs where you do outreach to uh, HBCUs. We're also doing outreach to the Appalachian, Appalachian communities of universities as well. And one of the things we find is, you know, how do, how do we reduce those barriers to entry? And how do we increase awareness of the Air Force STTR program? You know, once I went out and we did our first kickoff event in April about the Air Force STTR program, we started to get proposals in. You know, it's just a matter of getting that awareness, increasing that awareness to the community and also helping and helping along the way. So making sure that we are providing all of the resources that are needed, it's not anything different that we would provide other universities. It's just that that awareness and those resources that are, are available and reducing those barriers to entry. So the whole goal is to increase HBCU participation in the STTR program. We've already seen increase in proposals, and then we have a solicitation coming up um, that opens up here. And so those are uh, our 20.3C solicitation. We have three solicitations a year. My goal for the program is that participation increases, and it gets to the point where it's just it's just something that is a part of their research portfolio every year. You know, every university has their roadmap, you know, how are they going to align their research portfolio? And so I would just hope that the Air Force is a part of that. One thing that I want to stress is it's not that it's not that HBCUs need the Air Force. It's the Air Force, we need innovative ideas from our, everywhere. And we don't want to miss out because we're talking about our national defense here. And uh, HBCUs, Appalachian uh, universities are an integral part of our national research and development strategy. And so we need them to, to come with their innovative ideas to help us, you know, at the end of the day, fight the fight, fight the good fight. So it's really important. 
And that's, I mean, super inspiring. I think that you are finding the best minds from around the nation, um, really uh, pooling from those uh, those thought pools, whether they're engineers, uh, whether they are going to be some of the next future leaders or shakers of the Air Force. I mean, you're giving them the resources or at least making that connection uh, to help you. So since this has started, since you've seen some successes, uh, what feedback have you gotten from HBCUs during this program? Have they been very uh, appreciative of the efforts here? Have you really gotten some great ideas from them? We're starting to do really focused training webinars uh, where we bring in maybe four four organizations at a time um, and also partnering with their regional procurement technical assistance centers and their sponsored research centers in, in their university communities. And so it's been really positive feedback. And then even our small businesses that are maybe located near one of the HBCU communities and they're saying, oh, wow, you know, because we do a lot of data analytics in partnership with our partnership and intermediary agreement and, and APEX. And we also partner with our Black Data Processing Association, BEPA, to identify small businesses to partner with HBCUs. And so the feedback has been just just great in terms of, hey, those are some research areas that, that you're doing. OK, you're doing AI or artificial intelligence. There is a university that is working in your area that's also doing artificial intelligence. <clears throat> How can you guys connect to do, because um, at the end of the day, we want them to submit very highly competitive proposals so that they can compete because it's, it's a very highly competitive program. So we're getting folks ready to submit a very highly competitive proposal into the program. So to learn a little bit more about the SITTER side of your job, so SITTER is Small Business Technology Transfer, and that's where actually small businesses partner with nonprofit research institutions. So that's where the universities come into play? Yeah, so for SCTR, uh, there is 40% of the work goes to the small business. 30% of the work um, goes to the research institution. And so that leaves 30% that can go to, it can go more to the, to the university, more to the small business, or you can even bring in another outside partner, a venture capitalist, however you look at it. And the contract is held with the small business. Um, and so the small business is looking for a research institution partner, nonprofit or research institution partner to uh, meet that technology capability gaps that they may have. Um, so that's one of the great things about the program. And also with STTR and the Air Force Research Laboratory uh, Small Business Directorate, it's a very unique uh, small business office. It's, it's probably the most unique small business office across the Air Force in that it has Air Force level programs within it. So the Air Force Service Center Program is an Air Force level program. Um, it also has the Air Force Technology Transfer and Transition Office that is located within our small business office. We also have our small business professionals. We have our um, chief entrepreneur who is helping uh, Air Force Research Lab. They've got that entrepreneur bug to help them be successful in starting a spinoff business from AFRL work. When you get involved in STTR or CIBR, you have the opportunity to get exposed um, and resources from all of the programs within our directorate. You know, our technology transfer program, they don't provide funding. However, you have access to our technology laboratories within the Air Force Research Laboratory. You know, that that is monumental in terms of what what you're able to to access and um, you know, whether you need you need to test out your UAVs in one of our in one of our wind tunnels. You know that's something that our technology transfer program can assist with. Or maybe the Air Force have you have something that the Air Force could test in one of your laboratories. So there's a lot that that can that's available for you know. I've worked with a lot of engineers and researchers and just finding out a lot of the different things that they can do with what they're doing every day just to to maximize that and make it make it better. So. Sure. So not necessarily like the examples that you give of like testing in a wind tunnel, you, you probably can't even totally put a, a price on access to some of these like really unique facilities uh, to, to make these small businesses help themselves and also help the Air Force, you know, fulfill a need. So even if there's not dollars associated there, there's just 
really unique opportunity that doesn't exist elsewhere. Right, right. And tied with that, so we've had a, a very like amazing look at the incredible career you have and uh, really talking about the Sibber and Sitter programs. Do you have a, a success story to kind of highlight how amazing it is not only to work with them, but something you may have seen go through during your uh, time here with the programs? So uh, I think I have a, a couple, and one of them is, is really the partnership I've seen is, is really kind of getting started, but like with um, on the HBCU side, I've seen where Tennessee State has already partnered with other small businesses like Juxtopia, for example. Um, the, the founder is Dr. Jayfus Doswell, and they've already gotten some highly competitive proposals that they've put into our Cyber and Sitter Department of Defense proposals. And so I'm excited to see to see where that goes. Also, when I first moved off base and I was working at uh, the Wright Brothers Institute's uh, 444 office in downtown Dayton. I met up with a guy, his name is Nick Ripplinger, and he is the CEO of Battlesight Technologies. Um, he's a veteran as well. And so one of the things that kind of a spinoff from the work that his partner was doing in our research laboratory was kind of a chemical essence uh, writing instrument. So it enhances communication and low light and no light conditions so that you're able to see invisible markings on various people. So it's almost like you could, if you took a, a highlighter and you're out, let's say you're out on operational mission and you have one of your, your troops is down, but you need to be able to, to mark them so that they come and, and get rescued later. And so him and his partner came up with these uh, pens that actually marked but the enemy can't see them. But if you have a, a special visual ray, then you're able to see them as well. And so um, Nick had this really great technology. I mean, that sounds like that's something that, that the Air Force absolutely needs, right? So I was able to connect him to one of the more veteran companies that uh, small businesses that participate in the Cyber and Sitter program. They're very familiar with, with the program and, and, and how it works and to get him connected with one of those uh, small businesses. And so they partnered and um, brought Battlesite onto to their existing cyber contract to get that technology as fast as possible. And then from there, Battlesite went on to submit their own proposal into our, our first Air Force pitch day competition for a cyber technology. And, you know, it was in New York City, great event, Dr. Roper, the brainchild of, hey, this is something that we really need to do. We need to shake up our Air Force acquisitions. And so uh, why not Why not better than using the Air Force Civil Center program and in investing in small businesses who say, hey, it's so hard to work with the Air Force because it takes so long to get on contract. You know, I don't ever get my money. I always got to get a bridge loan. And so at that competition, and Nick went in and he briefed his technology and came out and 15 minutes later, he received his first phase one pitch, a uh, phase one contract award from, you know, a pitch and, you know, it was like, okay, and now we're going to swipe our credit card in your square and you're going to get your first payment, you know, 15 minutes later. And so that, uh, and that, that demonstrated, you know, that's not something that we do with every single server center contract. However, we are able to really streamline the contracting process. Kim Yoder and Sarah French in our center of excellence are leading the charge in terms of getting small businesses on contract faster. I remember being in the hallway when all of this activity was happening and we were kind of taking a break and I heard one of the small businesses on the phone, um, they saw the press release like, oh, hey, we just won a phase one contract award because you sign your contract, you know, the day of. And they were, their lawyer, their uh, banker called and said, hey, I heard you got a Air Force contract. Are you ready to go ahead and, and set up that, get that loan, that bridge loan set up? And they're like, I already got paid. I don't even need to take out a loan. So, uh, you know, just those those things when you, when you really are innovative in your approach to acquisitions, there's so much that we can do. And I, I just, I've loved seeing 
Nick go from, hey, this is uh, something that the Air Force needs into where we can finally get it to where we can get those technologies to help our warfighters, you know, a lot more quickly. So it's a win for, for everyone. So. If you guys haven't heard the podcast listeners, we do, yeah. that's one of our earlier podcasts and um, what a, not only, like, not only deserving of what uh, the partnership he has with us, but just uh, what the inspiring speakers. So to hear his full story from your perspective, to see what it was like on our side is great. Um, I mean, I will never forget having the experience to wear night vision goggles and write with the IR chalk. We actually got to write lab life with it. And it was, I mean, it was so cool. They had like a little almost closet. He's like, Hey, you want to try it out? Just go in there do it he was just such a, a genuine amazing person so i'm glad to hear that uh these success stories um not only impact the small business directly but really impact us to meet uh, incredible people we may not have otherwise you know just really having um it all goes back to that that service is, is being accessible to uh small businesses to ensure you know we're doing our our deal with diligence on our side to make sure that they can be successful so you know that's why i do this is because I love to see people be successful in, in their areas and where they're going. If you haven't got the chance, if Nick never let you actually try out the IR chalk or put on the uh, night vision goggles, um, I'll let him know and say, hey, Anissa needs to try this out. It is, it's an amazing experience, and I'll make sure you get the chance. I know just knowing about you a little bit outside of the podcast and even learning some new things about you from this episode, I just, I just really want to say that you like, you're a builder, you're a community builder. Like I know you're like a Girl Scout leader and you have some great community initiatives to revitalize, you know, part of our region. And then you're doing all this great work with small businesses through the Air Force Cyber Sitter program. Just, I just want to thank you for that. That is just so cool that the impact you're making on our Air Force in the world. You know, when I look at the Air Force in general, or just people who can join the military, you know, one people, there's only, uh, like 71% of Americans are ineligible to even serve in the military. And so, you know, I consider the people that get the opportunity to serve in the military, because, you know, sometimes, you you know, whether it's health reasons or um, other things like that, people are not able to be able to, um, I consider this to be a very elite group. So I take pride in having the opportunity in my experiences that I've had um, as a woman, as a black woman, as a mother of, you know, a, a, a black girl and the mother of a black son, um, you know, I have my Girl Scout troop. And so I make sure that I incorporate, you know, various experiences in, in my career that I've experienced and get, it's all about exposure. And so when I look at, uh, you know, the community that I come from, I want to ensure that they are exposed to as much as possible so because you never know where your path can can take you and where your path can lead you and i think if um you're at uh, in a leadership position or you've had uh, people have helped me along the way so you always make sure you 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 know reach back and give back if everybody does their part to ensure that the community is thriving and better and especially our children, it just makes it better for, you know, our nation as a whole. And so if we want, you know, our our next generation to be successful, a lot of times it's just about, it's just about exposure. You know, in the Air Force, we teach integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. And so for, for me, that tra- I translate that into my life personally and professionally in in everything that I do. You know, make mistakes along the way, be able to let our, our next generation make mistakes along the way, but also to to show them the other, you know, other ways, other career paths or other different approaches to things. And so that I may not have all the answers, but I may know somebody else who has, you know, an answer to that question. So I take that, you know, and I love my my Girl Scouts. I love doing things with my community, I'm really active in sports. And so I'm around a lot of kids and youth. I have I usually have a lot of kids in my house uh, doing different things. So that that's something that I I really hold uh, near and dear to to me um, as a person, and it's just really important to me. Thanks for sharing that message and your story and joining us today. I really appreciate it.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, just I, I always love talking to you, Michelle. And, you know, we've done a lot of a lot of things together. We got a chance to go through our, our leadership leadership dating class and really got a chance to, to you know, chit chat amongst that. So it's always good to talk to, to old buddies from our AFRL and Ken, nice talking to you as well. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. And remember, stay curious. Logging off.